Welcome to the program, Edmonia Lewis, an artist of determination and courage. I am Bobby Reno, the East Greenbush Town Historian, and I will be your narrator for this program. A disturbing quote. Never yet could I find that a black has uttered a thought above the level of plain narration, never saw an elementary trait of painting or sculpture. Thomas Jefferson, Notes of the State of Virginia, 1787. I don't want you to praise me, for I know praise is not good for me. Some praise me because I am a colored girl and I don't want that kind of praise. I had rather you would point out my defects, for that will teach me something. Edmonia Lewis When asked why she sculpted, Edmonia replied, to do something for race, something that will excite the admiration of the other races of the earth. From an interview with a reporter, from the Cincinnati Daily Enquirer, November 24, 1873, Edmonia was described this way. Miss Lewis is below the medium height and is rather heavy set, though well proportioned. She has a rather full face, good natured features, which are radiant with the smiles of a pleasant disposition. The simplicity and artlessness of her nature are apparent in all she says. Her conversation is affable, graceful, and winning. Information on Edmonia's early years is vague, particularly her birth and the location of her birth. Her birth years have been reported anywhere from 1840 to 1845. However, a passport that she filled out states that she was born July the 4th, 1844 in Greenbush, New York. I know that this passport is very hard to read. The writing is small, but it does say where the red arrow points, Greenbush, New York. One also has to take into consideration of the date July the 4th. Most people of color did not keep records of their date of birth. So when asked to fill out a form which required a date of birth, they used July 4th, the birth of our country. Edmonia described her father as full-blooded Negro and her mother Catherine as full-blooded Chippewa, a wild Indian. She also described her mother as copper-colored with straight black hair. Edmonia's Indian name was Wildfire. Her given name was Mary Edmonia Lewis. However, the book, titled Child of Fire, Mary Edmonia Lewis and the Problem of Art History's Black and Indian Subject by Kirsten Pye Buick, Claims evidence suggests that Edmonia's mother Catherine was actually born in Canada to a mother who was part African-American and Ojibwa and whose father was John Mike, an escaped slave. By the time Edmonia was eight years old, both her parents had died. At this point, we do not know what the cause of death were for her parents. She was raised by her two aunts, sisters of her mother, on the Chippewa Ojibwa reservation. Edmonia was influenced by the Chippewa's matriarchal society. Women had powers of property, legacy, decision making. The Chippewa prized steely integrity and restrained emotional expression. Edmonia's mother, Catherine, lived with her parents on the reservation called the Credit River Reserve near Lake Ontario. In Canada, Native Americans living on a reservation are entitled to an annual payment from the Canadian government. 
However, membership in the tribe came from the father. Since Catherine's father was black, the Council of Tribal Elders excluded him and his family from receiving payment and pressured the family to leave the reservation. Records show the family moved to Albany, New York. Eventually, Catherine married a black man with the last name of Lewis, who was from the West Indies and was a gentleman's servant. Samuel Lewis, Edmonia's older brother, was born in 1832, and soon thereafter the family moved to Newark, New Jersey. Early in 1844, they moved again to Greenbush, New York, where Edmonia was born. I have a brother who went to California and dug gold. When I had been three years with our mother's people, he came to me and said, Edmonia, I don't want you to stay here always. I want you to have some education. Edmonia Lewis in an interview with abolitionist Lydia Maria Child in 1864. Edmonia's brother Samuel had gone out west to dig gold, and he was successful. He settled in Bozeman, Montana, and opened three businesses, barber shops, and was successful in these businesses. When he passed away, his obituary stated he was an esteemed citizen of Bozeman, Montana. With her brother Samuel paying her tuition, Edmonia schooling began at a boarding school with a Captain S. R. Mills in Albany, New York, for four years. From 1856 to 1858, she attended New York Center College, a near bankrupt Baptist prep school in McGrawville, New York, where she was discharged, she was quoted as saying, for being too wild. They did not know what to do with me. New York Center College in McGrawville, New York, was a Baptist college that went bankrupt due to the financial difficulties of the American Civil War. However, its faculty was very esteemed. On its faculty and among its supporters were George Vachon, the first African-American lawyer in New York State. Also, Charles Reason, who was the first African-American college professor in the United States, and William G. Allen, who taught Greek language and was the second African-American professor in New York State. The reason for Edmonia's discharge is confusing because here are her grades at New York Center College. And as you can see, she did very well. Edmonia then enrolled at Oberlin College, which she attended from 1859 through 1862. Her tuition was paid for by her brother Samuel. A little bit about Oberlin College. Oberlin College was established on September 2, 1833. The African Americans of Oberlin and those attending Oberlin College have experienced intense challenges and immense accomplishments since their joint founding in 1833. Its African American and other students of color have used education and activism to influence the college, the town, and beyond. Their efforts have helped Oberlin remain committed to its values of freedom, social justice, and service. The college's approach to African Americans was by no means perfect. Intensely anti-slavery, Oberlin was the only college to admit black students in the 1830s and also women. By the 1880s, however, with the fading of evangelical idealism, the school began segregating its black students. This is a photograph of Oberlin College as it appeared in the 1860s.
Edmonia was admitted to the three-year preparatory course headed by the strict Mrs. Marianne F. Dascombe, head of the female department. There was a connection to the Underground Railroad with Mrs. Marion F. Dascombe. The source, the Granite State Monthly, Volume 2, published in 1902. Edmonia had difficulties adjusting to life at Oberlin College. Being raised by the nature-loving Chippewa, she was indifferent to materialistic values. She was not schooled in the niceties of young ladies' talk. She struggled with her personal and cultural identity because of that. Also considered cheerful in her nature, she was judged too independent and brisk. But it was at Oberlin that Edmonia found her talent and her love of art. She passed her studies without a problem, and by her third year she had adjusted to college life, making friends with two girls who came from nearby town, two white girls. It was at Oberlin that Monia started to identify herself more with her African-American heritage. At Oberlin, Edmonia resided in the home of the Reverend John Keep and his wife. Reverend Keep was an abolitionist who championed women's rights and the rights of women and African Americans to a college education. He cast the deciding vote to allow women and African Americans to attend Oberlin College in 1835. The photograph shows the home today. There was a dark turn in Edmonia's time at Oberlin College. Although Oberlin College was an abolitionist college, not everyone at Oberlin College nor in the town of Oberlin wanted African Americans to receive an education. The Cleveland Plain Dealer headline, Mysterious Affair at Oberlin, Suspicion of Foul Play, Two Young Ladies Poisoned, the Suspect Under Arrest. On January 27th of 1862, the two girls that Monia had befriended went on a sleigh ride with two young men who were reportedly sailors, during which the girls became very ill. They accused Edmonia of spiking their hot spiced wine with contharsis, better known as Spanish fly, before they went on the sleigh ride. Edmonia was the suspect. She proclaimed her innocence. However, Edmonia was arrested and charged with poisoning by cantharis. This photograph is John Mercer Langston, a prominent African-American lawyer who represented Edmonia. He was a graduate of Overland himself. His distinguished career included president of Howard University and in the Congress of the United States. Before a hearing for Edmonia could take place, on a cold winter night, Edmonia stepped outside from her residence and was grabbed by unknown attackers, dragged into a nearby field covered with snow, assaulted and brutally beaten into unconsciousness. She was left to die in the frigid night air. Once it was discovered that Edmonia was missing, the town bells were rung in alarm, and a search was progressed. She was discovered seriously injured and near death. The hearing was delayed a month while Edmonia recuperated. Her trial lasted six days from February 26 to March the 3rd, 1862. Eventually, she was exonerated for lack of evidence. She returned to her studies suffering from depression 
because of the false accusation by so-called friends and the brutal attack. The two white girls never returned back to Oberlin College. However, the harassment of Edmonia Lewis continued. She was belittled by cruel remarks, ostracized, and again she was falsely accused, this time of stealing, stealing art supplies. Oberlin, fearing bad publicity, did not expel Edmonia, but simply did not renew her enrollment for the next semester. Edmonia was denied her degree. Edmonia suffered humiliation. Chippewa tradition calls for revenge for humiliation. Edmonia decided she would show Oberlin they had misjudged and mistreated her. She would do this through her art. Edmonia headed to Boston, Boston being an abolitionist city, carrying a letter of introduction from the abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison that the Reverend John Keep was able to obtain for her. She sought out the sculptor Edward A. Brackett, who sculpted the bust of John Brown. I thought the man who made a bust of John Brown must be a friend to my people, Edmonia said. Edward Brackett began teaching Edmonia how to sculpt. She supported herself by making and selling small medallions made of clay. In the studio building where she took her lessons, her brother Samuel rented her a small space for her studio where she hung out a sign on the door, Edmonia Lewis, artist. I called myself an artist, although my friends laughed at me for it, Edmonia Lewis. This is a photograph of the building in Boston where Edmonia studied sculpture and had her studio. It was taken down many years ago, and it is my understanding today that an art center exists on the place where it once stood. On May 28, 1863, Edmonia stood on a curb in Boston and watched the famous all-black 54th Massachusetts Regiment led by Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, who was a white man from a prominent Boston family march by. Colonel Shaw had elected to serve and command the 54th Massachusetts Regiment, an all African American regiment during the American Civil War. Six weeks later, Colonel Shaw was killed with most of the 54th Regiment as they charged Fort Wagner in South Carolina. Emotionally moved by Colonel Shaw and the 54th Regiment and their deaths in battle, and working mostly from memory from a few photographs, she created the bust of Colonel Robert Gould Shaw, her first recognized, critically acclaimed piece. It seemed to me as if he were actually in the room, admitting that as she worked, she also kissed the clay. Lewis then made plaster cast reproductions of the bust. She sold 100 at $15 a piece. The sculpture is now in the Museum of African American History in Boston. A poem titled Edmonia Lewis from an unknown author in an unknown publication. The young colored woman who has successfully modeled the bust of Colonel Shaw. She hath wrought well with her unpracticed hand, the mirror of her thought reflected clear. This youthful hero martyr of our land, with touch harmonious she has molded here, a memory and a prophecy 
both dear, the memory of one who was so pure. By the summer of 1865, Edmonia had ended her lessons with Edward A. Brackett, and she had earned enough money, together with some financial support from her brother Samuel and other abolitionists, such as the Reverend Robert C. Waterston and his wife, Anna Quincy Waterston, to go to Rome, Italy, to further her training. I thought I knew everything when it came to Rome. But I soon found I had everything to learn. Edmonia Lewis Edmonia trained in the neoclassicism style of the time. In Rome, where there was less prejudice against her race and gender, Edmonia produced major pieces of internationally recognized and critically acclaimed work. The photograph on the upper left is the only known photograph of Edmonia in Rome, Italy. Strange Sisterhood Outside the Land of Liberty In Rome, Edmonia was part of a group of women sculptors, disrespectfully called that strange sisterhood of American lady sculptors who at one time settled upon the seven hills in a white marmorean flock a quote by Henry James, an American-born British writer. However, within this group, Edmonia was alone and eventually abandoned as she apparently offended them by raising money to send one of her sculptures to Boston. Do you know what marmorean means? I didn't, so I looked it up. Marmorean meaning marble-like. I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for our culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my color. The land of liberty had no room for a colored sculptor. Edmonia Lewis This is my favorite part of the program where we get to see the beautiful work of Edmonia Lewis. I will pause here a bit and allow you to look over these beautiful works of art. This is a bust of Anna Quincy Waterston, carved by Edmonia Lewis. It is now in the Smithsonian American Art Museum, a gift of Dr. Richard Freights. Anna Quincy Waterston and her husband, the Reverend Robert C. Waterston, helped finance Edmonia in Rome. Anna Quincy Waterston wrote this poem, titled Edmonia Lewis. Tis fitting that a daughter of the race, whose chains are breaking, should receive a gift, so rare a genius. Never pause, nor place, fashion or wealth, pride, custom, caste, nor hue, can arrogantly claim what God doth lift above these chances 
and bestows on few. This is Edmonia Lewis's most famous work, The Death of Cleopatra. The Death of Cleopatra, carved in 1876, was brought over from Rome to the 1876 Centennial Exposition in Philadelphia. Then it was placed in storage until the 1878 Chicago Interstate Exhibition. It was purchased by a racetrack owner and placed on the grave of his favorite horse named Cleopatra at a Chicago racetrack. The deed to the property stipulated it was to remain on the property. After the racetrack closed, it became a golf course and then a munitions factory during World War II. All this while, the sculpture remained on the property. The post office built a bulk mail center, and in 1972, the sculpture was moved to a contractor's heavy equipment yard. At one point, well-meaning Boy Scouts painted it white. In 1987, the Forest Park Historical Society found it in a storage room at a local shopping mall amongst the Christmas decorations. Dr. Marilyn Richardson, the foremost authority on Edmonia Lewis, was called in to identify it. It is now in the Smithsonian American Art Museum since 1994 after a $50,000 restoration with the white paint removed. An up close view of the details on the shoes of the sculpture, The Death of Cleopatra. In April of 2019, I was privileged to visit Williams College Museum of Art in Williamstown, Massachusetts, and I viewed the bust of Hiawatha on the left and the bust of Minnehaha on the right. Both were acquired from the Otis Family Acquisition Trust in 2018. Edmonia Lewis visited the United States several times in the latter part of the 1800s. Her work was presented in major galleries and exhibitions. Her work sold for large sums of money. In 1873, an article in the New Orleans Picayune stated, Edmonia Lewis had snared two $50,000 commissions. Her newfound popularity made her studio a tourist destination. Tufts, Eleanor, 19th century. Our Hidden Heritage, New York, Paddington Press, 1974. She rose above the meanness and violence she experienced. In the courage of those who fought against slavery, struggled against the oppression of women, and in the spirituality of Native Americans, and ultimately her religious faith, Lewis found her great themes. In her work she obtained a dignity that in her own life she was often denied. Years of silence have deprived most Americans of the knowledge of her historic achievements. She is a heroic and legendary figure in American art. Harry Henderson, author of the book, The Indomitable Spirit of Edmonia Lewis, a narrative biography. Lydia Maria Child wrote about Edmonia's strong will what she undertakes to do, she will do, though she has to cut through the heart of a mountain with a penknife. Researching Edmonia No matter what frame you put around her, she was unique and succeeded against the odds. Karen Lemmy, Curator of Sculpture at the Smithsonian Museum which owns several of Lewis's work, said. But there's this kind of vagueness to the details of her life.
I want to introduce you to Dr. Marilyn Richardson. She's a retired professor and has spent many years researching the life of Edmonia Lewis. She is the foremost authority on the life and works of Edmonia Lewis. The last years of Edmonia's life are as vague as those of the beginning of her life. By 1901, Edmonia's whereabouts were unknown. No trace of her in Rome or elsewhere for over a century. However, Professor Richardson's diligent research paid off. The finding of census records indicated Edmonia moved to London, England from Rome. With the aid of a lawyer engaged by Dr. Richardson in London, Edmonia's will and burial records were located. Edmonia died in Hammersmith Infirmary in London on September 17, 1907 of Bright's disease, a chronic and painful kidney ailment. She was buried on September 20, 1907 in St. Mary's Catholic Cemetery, grave number 350C, a cemetery on Harrow Road, London, England. Edmonia was a devout Catholic. Her Roman Catholic baptismal name was Maria Ignatia. She requested her death notice to be published in the tablet, a Roman Catholic publication, and wanted a simple statement with no mention of her accomplishments. It simply read, Edmonia Lewis, spinster and sculptor. Edmonia was devoted to the Blessed Mother. She felt the Blessed Mother looks after the women of the world. In her will, Edmonia left the bulk of her estate to the Reverend Charles Cox, 1856 through 1916, and Our Lady of Victories Church in London, England. Edmonia's will read in part, I wish that on my decease the usual preparations for burial may be carried out under the supervision of a Catholic nun, and that my body be enclosed in a dark walnut-colored coffin. I desire that a funeral service be carried out over my body in the Catholic Church of Our Lady of Victories, Kensington, prior to its interment, and that the body be carried to the Kensal Green Catholic Cemetery, St. Mary's Cemetery now, on a hearse that shall be draped so that as to completely cover the coffin from view. I desire further that my body be followed to the grave by two Catholic nuns in a carriage. A Lost Work of Edmonia Lewis In St. Louis, St. Elizabeth's Church was organized by a Bishop Patrick Ryan to serve St. Louis African American Catholics. The first church was dedicated May 18, 1873. In 1912, it moved to a new location where the Sisters of the Blessed Sacrament opened a school nearby. Sadly, this parish no longer exists. Edmonia was commissioned to carve a marble statue of the Blessed Mother for St. Elizabeth's. Unfortunately, there is no record known of the statue's whereabouts today. However, the St. Louis County Library has a photograph, which you see here, taken in 1939 from the parish's Diamond Jubilee, showing the statue behind two sisters. On February 25th, 2020, I received a reply to a letter that I wrote to the Archdiocese of St. Louis, Cardinal Regali Center, requesting information if they had any record as to the statue's whereabouts once St. Elizabeth's closed. And I received this reply. Dear Ms. Reno, thank you for contacting the Archdiocese of St. Louis Archives. 
we received your request for information about a statue of the Blessed Mother commissioned by Edmonia Lewis at St. Elizabeth. I checked our St. Elizabeth records, and unfortunately there was no information on the whereabouts of the statue. The church closed in 1951, and typically when churches close, their sacred items are dispersed to other parishes in the diocese as needed. We now have a reclamation office that maintains and oversees the repurposing of sacred items when closings occur. However, at the time St. Elizabeth closed in 1951, there was no such office and no record was kept as to the where the statue ended up. Sorry, I could not be of more help. Let me know if I can be of further assistance. Sincerely, Sarah Coffey. It appears that more research will have to be done on the location of this statue. When I saw this photo taken by Scott Barlin, Esquire, of the condition of Edmonia's grave, I was very dismayed. After seeing the condition of Edmonia's grave in St. Mary's Catholic Cemetery, I contacted Ms. Anna Humphrey, the superintendent. She was extremely helpful and provided me with the contact information of Mr. John Doe of the E.M. Lander Company, London, England. They did the restoration work to restore Edmonia's grave. The fundraiser I did through GoFundMe and with the generous donations that were received, the E.M. Lander Company completed their work and provided these photographs. Today on the Oberlin College campus there stands a building, the Edmonia Lewis Center for Women and Transgender People. It is a collective of students, staff, and administrators who strive to transform existing systems of oppression based on sex, gender, race, class, sexuality, age, ability, size, religion, nationality, ethnicity, and language. The house was originally built for James Monroe, not the president, but an important abolitionist advocate of voting rights for African Americans, and a friend of Frederick Douglass. Monroe taught at Oberlin College, served as a U.S. Consul to Brazil, and was a five-term U.S. Congressman. This is a photograph of the Edmonia Lewis Center for Women and Transgender People. However, there is an update. On May 4, 2018, the Oberlin Review reported the center has shut down due to dwindling activities at the center. It is my understanding today that Oberlin College is seeking to name another building or facility after Edmonia Lewis. More than 30 of Edmonia's sculptures are in private collections cemeteries, as well as in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Art Institute of Chicago, Fog Art Museum, Newark Museum, Detroit Museum, and St. Louis Art Museum, to name a few. I want to thank Janine Atkins, author of Stone Mirrors, The Sculpture and Silence of Edmonia Lewis, for permission to use the photographs on her Pinterest site for this presentation, 
and to albert henderson author of the indomitable spirit of edmonia lewis a narrative biography by harry henderson and albert henderson for permission to use their book for reference and i also want to thank you for viewing this program on edmonia lewis